this is the first plenary session at the upper chamber after the inauguration of the 10th National Assembly. Expectedly, the lawmakers exchange pleasantries as they await the commencement of sitting. President of the Senate is Senator Gotsula Pabio, his deputy Senator Jubrin Barao and other principal officers arrive in the chamber and make their ways to their seats. After everyone had settled in, the President of the Senate called the meeting to order and almost immediately asked the non-senators to leave the chamber so the Senate could have a closed-door session. When the doors were opened again to the media, the Senate resolves to write to the President, Bola Tunubu, international parliamentary bodies and others, informing them that the 10th Assembly has begun in earnest. The resolution is following the motion moved by the Deputy Senate President. The President of the Senate then set up a committee to address pertinent issues of members of the Senate. I'd like to uh, set up uh, a, a, a committee to look into the welfare of the, of the members. Outside the chamber, some senators speak on issues they are looking forward to handle. We will focus on the constitution to do with the federal system, physical federalism, uh, the issue of reducing power from the federal government to the state, all of the above. We are trying to see what we can do in terms of legislation to make sure that every aspect of Kogi State, where federal presence should be, there must be legislation to compare the federal government to come in and work for us. The challenges we have about security which is, as I usually opine, closely related to unemployment. We must begin to patronize ourselves as Nigerians in all ramifications. The Senate has adjourned plenary to July 4, 2023. Welcome back, Mr. Ernest Ekere, Associate Professor, Political Science, University of Abuja, is here with us. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you very much. Good morning. I well, believe the name is Ereke. Ereke. Sorry. <laughs> I thought that's what I said. No. <laughs> oh, dear. My mind must be playing tricks on me this yeah. time. I apologize. I know you understand that. Yeah. So, having seen all that's gone on and the kinds of um, focus and attention Nigerians paid to the National Assembly, upon its inauguration. Let me ask you, as an academic, in political science specifically, what kinds of consideration do you give to these kind of matters? Uh, it depends on the matters you make. National Assembly, the, the National Assembly, the, in terms of the, the, role, the, the leadership of the National Assembly, politics around it. Mm -hmm. Of course, it is um, the usual expectation that you would have when a, a new assembly is coming on board. And um, our political history since uh, 1999 shows that um, uh, there is always this attempt by the executive to want to influence who becomes a principal officer in the National Assembly. And um, maybe because you asked uh, as an academic, theoretically speaking, because um, across the world, we have um, strong executive. We have across the world very strong executive who would want, you know, um, to have um, unhindered access, you know, to power, to want to be able to push through their policies, their programs, and whatever ideas they have. So, and sometimes so this... A, sorry to interrupt, that, that's yes. not a peculiarly Nigerian problem. We, no, we, uh, it is not peculiarly a Nigerian problem. It is a global issue that we have very powerful and very strong executive across the world. Now, what, what now happens, happens is that you must now have a, a parliament or a legislature that will be able to, you know, uh, put this executive to check. 
in accordance with the, the principles of uh, separation of, of, of powers. Are there national assemblies across the world that you think that Nigeria can follow the example in, you know, saying that they want to be as strong and as independent as, as those assemb assemblies? Oh, there are so many of them, <laughs> very, very many of them. I, I mean, we saw, um, maybe, maybe some people may say we shouldn't compare Nigeria and the United States, mm -hmm. but then we saw uh, the former president, Donald Trump, always crying about now generally the institutions of the state, you know, which haunting him. One of which was the, the, the Cong Congress. You will recall that the Congress impeached him twice as a result of certain infractions of, uh, of the law. So there are so many uh, legislatures across the world that Nigeria can emulate. But we don't necessarily need to emulate. All we need to do is to put into practice mm. well, the we principles saw. of separation of powers. I'm which glad is that you brought up, up that example. Laws. I'm glad that you brought up that example because mm. also I think very much like us, they operate the bicameral legislature as well. And we saw how you know the body that might be compared with our own uh, House of Representatives consistently seem to be on Donald Trump's case, mm -hmm. but not the uh, the, I don't want to say the upper chamber because we've been corrected that there is no upper or lower here. Uh, but we, we saw that the Senate just simply refused, or, or the, the country's equivalent of a Senate re refused to toe that same line owing to political considerations. So I don't know if that will be uh, an ideal example of where the legislature is exercised because at that point, it will now depend on where you stand. There were Americans who felt very strongly that, it, that its National Assembly was doing the right thing. Others felt that it had been heavily politicized and w was really witch-hunting the president. So are, are there others? Can we find other neutral situations, maybe not in the United States, where indeed Parliament has been able to exert its influence as that check and balance to the executive arm of government? Okay, maybe just to also make a little reference to the, the issue of um, the Senate and the House of Reps in, um, in the United States. Of course, you cannot always take away partisanship from the conduct of the business of the legislature. It will always be there. After all, they emerge through political parties who, which have ideas of how they want the state to be run. So the issue, uh, the idea of the, the, the Senate or the legislature being partisan will always be there. Now, but if you ask about other examples we can, we can follow, there are so many of them, like we have said. I mean, if you look at some parliamentary uh, systems across the world, you see how they, they keep you know, the government in, in check. And so, but the bottom line is that we need to begin to be able to put some of these uh, institutions and, uh, and laws that we have into practice. Now, one of the problems we have uh, uh, as, as a society, and maybe generally as, 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 as uh, African states, is that we have all of these institutions that have been you know, privatized and hijacked by individuals. And that is why you continue to have these very strong executives that you know, we talk about. In the Nigerian instance, for, for example, you find out that the executive is interested in who becomes the presiding officer. If both at the state level and at the federal level. And so as a result of this privatization, including even what we, you discussed earlier, including the security sector of the society, as a result of the fact of this uh, privatization, in, in, in quote, this personalization, this hijack of you know, institutions of the state, you find out that these institutions instead of serving the state, it's rather protecting the regime and the individuals that have hijacked them. That is why you would find a police that may want to pander you know, to the whims and dictates of a political party because they, they believe that they owe their loyalty, for instance, to the political party or to the person who has appointed them into positions of authority. When you made reference in passing to parliamentary system, was that a direct comparison between the parliamentary system and the presidential system? No, it is not a direct comparison. But ideally, you've, you discover that they virtually do the same thing. It is about making of laws. It is about uh, oversight. It is about representation. It is about ensuring that you protect the people who have you know, brought a government into being. Not a direct comparison because, of course, there are differences. So in, in terms of those challenges, why 
something that they're, in fact, we haven't even talked about the states, the, the assemblies, state assemblies, and whether or not they perform. Whoa, you, 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 you shake your head in what? That they're nowhere near expectation? Well, uh, of course, um, my impression about the state's houses of assembly in Nigeria is not different from your impression and the impression that Nigerians generally have about uh, state houses of assembly. Uh, they have become... Uh, more like departments in the offices of, uh, of, of governors across the country. And that is why you find out that uh, some Nigerians refer to state houses of assembly as houses of approval because they just approve anything that the executive brings to them. I mean, it is so bad that sometimes you find that appropriation bills are brought and passed almost uh, on, on the mm. same day. So but, uh, it, is, it is that bad at the state level. And it is how? also bad that Nigerians, including civil society organizations and yeah, other that, institutions, that's the point have I'm abandoned to that. Why that. do we allow that to happen? But then we will hold the uh, National Assembly to high regard. Why can't we extend that same scenario to other standards to the state as of assembly as well? It is because most of us are interested in what happens at, um, at the centre, mm -hmm. forgetting that democracy also has its own building blocks, from the local government to the state and then to the federal level. So most of us uh, are interested in uh, what happens at the centre. We don't look at what happens Different political scientists too. <laughs> in, interestingly, oh when he was talking about hijack, you know, that word was just swirling in my head. And I, I was wondering if, if it would be appropriate to describe uh, what mm. transpired in the National Assembly as a hijack. I mean, because if you, if you term that a hijack, uh, what would you then say happened at the State House of Assembly? Uh, because some people say it is legitimate for lobbying to happen. It is mm. legitimate also for parties to want to, uh, well, I say, yeah, say who they want to be at the helm of affairs what do you think ought to have happened instead? Okay, when I use the word hijack, I, I was making reference to the, to the fascination by leaders who want to um, make institutions of the state you know, serve their personal interests and not the national interest. And so if you liken that uh, to what happened at the National Assembly, uh, it, is, it, it is nearly, it is equally the same thing because... Now you have, uh, and it is not just particularly distant assembly. Like I said earlier, we have always had this situation where the executive has always been interested in who presides over the national assembly. And so uh, they begin That's to... a legitimate interest, isn't it? <laughs> well, After all, their success would depend heavily on who's there, wouldn't it? Now, no, if you have, um, what, you may say it is a legitimate uh, interest, but then ultimately you discover that um, some of these uh, leaderships that are somehow imposed or influenced by executive would always want to be subservient to the executive. I mean, we saw, you know, what happened in the Ninth uh, Assembly that Nigerians um, often refer to as... Um, as a rubber stamp assembly. As yeah, which came in immediate meeting. contrast with what happened in the Eighth Assembly. Exactly. Uh, you saw a situation whereby initially the president wasn't interested in what was happening at the National Assembly, and we saw how that relationship eventually panned out with the Eighth Assembly and, you know, whatever it was that the executive arm was able to achieve in that time. So uh, it would seem that we've had very interesting opportunities to compare and contrast almost immediately uh, back to back even with the same administration or with the same person at the helm of affairs yeah. what could happen um, if a president shows interest or doesn't show interest what would you advocate should happen i mean given maybe that it's not the most ideal i mean we haven't tried so many more leaders after that uh, but what do you think should happen given what we experienced in both the eighth and the ninth assemblies well, I believe that what should happen is just to allow the, the, the principles of separation of powers to take its course, as well as the laws of the land, which, which allows members of the parliament or the legislature to decide who leads them. 
I mean, as an executive, if I have nothing to hide, if I have nothing, um, if I'm not intending to, to breach the laws of the land, why, why should you be interested in determining, insisting that uh, your, your candidates must emerge as, um, as presiding officers of, uh, of, of, of the parliament? I mean, if you stick to the laws of the land, the laws are very clear that the legislature is to look at the, the, your policies, your programs, and your ideas, and uh, give legislative backing if... So are you suggesting that decide? if you were the president, you would allow your opponent to hold that seat? Well, if, I, if, 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 if you elect me as the president, I'm sure I wouldn't be uh, overbearing in terms of determining who becomes uh, presiding officers of uh, the okay. National Assembly. Let's bring in Buki has some questions for you, and are you? Yes, thank you, Chamberlain. You know, still in the same breath, um, looking at the work of the National Assembly in terms of, you know, what it, its mandate really is, checks and balances on the executive. But in the light of what it has done over time, you know, we can look at how it has investigated allegations of misappropriation at the NDDC um, in the, I think, the, the eighth Senate now, but how the hunter became the hunted. And even where it has, you know, uh, successfully fingered uh, officials for abuse, investigation into the service-wide vote in the last uh, National Assembly where it made recommendations, but you know, very little has come out of it. Um, what structure can we begin to put in place, you know, to um, dictate, you know, um, a, a, a way of measuring, assessing the performance of the National Assembly? Because, you know, they would come and say that their work is not to make the job of the executive difficult, but then again, there must be a clear-cut yardstick for measuring the performance of the National Assembly such that uh, members can approach that job with a sense of, you know, what it's supposed to do. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's a very uh, interesting question. And um, if you look at the National Assembly over the years, um, we, we will always say that there are three core functions of the legislature. One is to make laws, the other is to represent, and the other one is to oversight. Now, if you look at uh, the responsibility of lawmaking, I think the National Assembly has lived up to expectation in terms of making laws. Now, but in the area of oversight and probably uh, representation, we would always score the National Assembly very low because, as you rightly noted, we have had several investigative hearings by the National Assembly, and at the end of the day, nothing came out of those hearings. The NDDC that you mentioned is a very uh, good, good example. And so what I would expect, particularly from the, the leadership of the 10th Assembly, is to ensure and insist that oversight responsibilities are taken very, very seriously by the various committees that uh, they would be constituting. It is not enough to conduct uh, investigative hearings or public hearings and nothing comes out of it eventually. And also is to say that uh, the leadership of the 10th Assembly must also insist and ensure that oversight responsibilities and functions going forward should, should not be like uh, the case uh, in the past, where some MDAs would always accuse committees and committee members of wanting, uh, of trying to curry favor, favors from them. Uh, so I, I expect that going forward, the Tenth Assembly should take very, very importantly, uh, very, very seriously the responsibility of oversight and not just conducting oversight, but taking it to its uh, logical conclusion. And then, of course, the, the assembly is empowered to, make, uh, to take certain actions in, in situations where they discover that, we have, that there have been infractions against the laws of the land. They can make recommendations such as uh, removal of officers, uh, make recommendations for prosecution of, of those who have been found wanting. I believe that the Tenth Assembly can distinguish itself by taking um, the responsibility of oversight very, very seriously and differently from what we have seen in the past. Uh, and in laying a charge before this Tenth Assembly, let's begin to look at specifics now. Um, the um, last Assembly had, you know, 
wholesale approved the securitization of the Ways and Means request. Uh, and we also hear that the last uh, administration had begun to default on um, the, the payment of subsidies. So can we begin to uh, demand, and do, are you optimistic in that regard anyway, uh, that uh, you know, the, the, the executive should be accountable about how you know, all of that funds was expended if we now know that um, you know, fuel subsidy, the, the last government has been defaulting on fuel subsidy, where did all of the money, uh, the, all of the loans go to? Okay, fine. Uh, I, I think it is also in line with the conversation we are having that ultimately it is the responsibility of the legislature to hold the executive to account for its actions as well as its inactions. Uh, the, the laws empower the, the legislature to look into any matter that is of concern to the state and to citizens. And so I, 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 want, to, I, I want to believe that if the 10th National Assembly is to be taken seriously. This, these are some of the issues that uh, they should be looking into. Uh, and uh, uh, borrowing from the, uh, the Senate president, this is going to be an uncommon 10th uh, Senate. And so I would expect that they keep away issues of, uh, of uh, parties and uh, begin to look at how funds that were appropriated were used or were mismanaged. I, I also want us to look at, you know, this proposal before um, the um, government, although the, a member of the commission is saying that, you know, um, it has not been, the president has not approved it, but it appears that that is not the last that we may have heard about the conversation, the proposal for an increase in salaries of um, public servants and uh, the members of the judiciary. Uh, an official says it has to go by way of legislation first to be presented uh, before the, um, the executive, that's the president. Now with the erosion of public trust, uh, and you know, this proposal is coming yet again, do you see the National Assembly you know, countering this, especially when you consider where we're coming from, how the party had its way with the uh, election of uh, you know, key officials into the leadership of the National Assembly? Well, I think your guess is as good as mine. I, I don't expect that um, they would jettison uh, whatever, the, uh, whatever is presented to them in terms of the, uh, the expected uh, increase in the emoluments of public officers. I'm also given the, the present situation in the country with the removal of waste subsidies and um, the, uh, the prices of uh, commodities going up across, uh, across the country. I don't expect that they would uh, jettison that, more so because uh, Nigerians um, believe that uh, the, the, their leaders always want to serve their own personal uh, interests and not that of, uh, of citizens. So, I'm not looking forward to, to the Senate um, surprising Nigerians by rejecting uh, that proposal. Mm. I'm no, not expecting that. Well, Mr. Reke, um, there, there, there's a comment that I'd like you to um, speak to and see whether or not it, it is anything of significance. Uh, the former president of the Senate, the president of the Ninth uh, National Assembly, uh, Ninth Senate and Chairman of the uh, Ninth National Assembly said 70% of the people who are in the National Assembly as at now are newbies and only 30% of them have institutional memory, um, both in the Senate and the House of Representatives. For you, how significant is that or how, how significant is that likely to be in legislations, in the procedures of the National Assembly for something veritable in the nation? Okay, thank you very much. I think we have had that conversation sometime uh, in this program. And um, I mentioned the fact that, yes, we'll be having um, more new members than uh, returning members. If you ask how significant that will be in terms of the business of the legislature, I would say it will, have, um, it will be very, very significant. I mean, we already saw that play out um, in the House of Representatives. If you had followed um, the sitting of the House, you would discover that uh, some of these new members had difficulties in uh, moving motions and, um, and adopting those motions. 
Now, so we'll have them learning on the job and it will impact very seriously on you know, the speed at which they will be, um, they, they will be carrying out the business of the, of the legislature. So it will have very, very significant impact. And that is why we've always advocated that uh, Nigerians should begin to return members, particularly members who have um, distinguished themselves in terms of the discharge of their responsibilities to the, uh, to the National Assembly. Now, the reasons are so many. One is because there will be that loss of, uh, of experience. There will be that loss of um, the resources that the nation has invested in building their capacities. Uh, and so you will also have this uh, slow pace of movement as far as legislative business is concerned. But there is also a remedy for that. The remedy is the legislative bureaucracy as well as the legislative aids that are made available to, to, to legislators. So if, if uh, these new members uh, will fall back on the legislative bureaucracy, it will help to overcome the, the teething challenges of having to learn how to conduct legislative business, as well as if they will be, the, if they will be critical in the appointment of their legislative aids. But what we have heard in the past is that Members will always look at perhaps family members, friends, and those who help them during elections in terms of appointing their legislative aides, instead of looking for experienced hands who would help them, you know, overcome these teaching challenges that we are beginning to see in the tenth assembly. So it will be very, very significant as far as legislative business is concerned. But like I said, there is always something to to be able to to use to overcome that. There is legislative bureaucracy, and then there is also a pool of experienced <coughs> legislative aides at the National Assembly. I mean, they are expected to also guide and ensure that things go right. We thank you for coming on, uh, Ernest Ereke, Associate Professor of Political Science, University of Abuja. We will be back in a moment and talk about the subsidy debate. It's still going on, so stay on with us. <laughs> 